In the previous video, we looked at the different molecular shapes. We broke them down into ideal molecular shapes, which is the ones that I've circled, and the non-ideal molecular shapes, which are the ones that I have not circled. And we basically described the difference as being the ideal molecular shapes have no lone pairs on the central atom. So the lone pairs would be the little green things. So look at the ideal molecular shapes. They have no lone pairs on the central atom. Central means the middle atom. And the non-ideal molecular shapes, so the bent one over here and the trigonal pyramidal one over here, they do have lone pairs on the central atom. So we broke down the molecular shapes into those two types. If you've missed the video where I went over the molecular shapes, I did it in quite a lot of detail. I showed the general formula. I showed you simulations of it. I described it. I gave examples. Check out the links in the description. But in this video, we're going to go over why it's important if a molecule has an ideal molecular shape or if it has a non-ideal molecular shape. What consequence does that have? Why do we care? So again, just as a summary, we have the ideal shapes. So some textbooks, some teachers, some study guides won't actually refer to it as ideal and non-ideal. That's just how I describe it. So the ideal molecular shapes have no lone pairs on the central atom. And these are the five that we described. Here's a few of them pictured over here. The important thing is look at the central atom. So central atom, in this case, this one, I don't know if you can actually see where I'm pointing, this one here and this one over here, there's no lone pairs. And that is in contrast with the non-ideal shapes on the right. You can see that they do have lone pairs. Now, we learned about two types, bent or angular, that's one type, and trigonal pyramidal, that's the second type. Now, why do we care? Well, if you have an ideal molecular shape, so if you are one of the five on the left-hand side over here, if you have an ideal molecular shape, no lone pairs on the central atom, then you most likely, there are always exceptions, but you most likely have a symmetrical or an even charge distribution. And this can contribute to you becoming a nonpolar molecule. I do go over this in another video. So, but for now, we're just going to focus on symmetrical or even charge distribution. So ideal shape, no lone pairs on the central atom, even or symmetrical charge distribution. Whereas if you're a non ideal molecular shape, you do have a lone pair on the central atom, and therefore you have an asymmetrical or uneven charge distribution. Now, how does this work? Let's do some examples. If we look at something basic like hydrogen, H2, we know that if we draw the Lewis dot diagram, hydrogen has one valence electron. This hydrogen here has one valence electron. If we work out the difference in electronegativity, which is something I did in previous videos in this playlist, so check it out if you missed that, we're going to get 2.1 minus 2.1, which gives me zero. Again, we discussed in previous videos in this playlist that this means that the bond is nonpolar. What this means is that both hydrogen atoms are sharing this pair of electrons evenly. One of these hydrogens doesn't have a greater pull on those shared electron pair than the other. So they're sharing it evenly. So when I describe this to my class, I say it's like two people holding a pen, they're sharing it evenly. One person isn't pulling the pen closer to them than the other person. Okay, so they're sharing that those pair, that pair of electrons evenly. It lies right in the center of them. Think of it like that. And what that means is that one hydrogen isn't more negative or more positive than the other. However, if we have a molecule like this one, HCl, and I work out the difference in electronegativity, first of all, if you have to draw the Lewis dot diagram, you know that hydrogen has one and chlorine has seven. So a single covalent bond is formed, as I show over there and as I've highlighted. But what is important is if I work out the difference in electronegativity for hydrogen chloride, HCl, I do the difference in ele electronegativity. I look, I'm looking at my periodic table over here. Chlorine has an electronegativity of 3, and hydrogen is 2.1. 3 minus 2.1 is 0 0.9. That means that it is a polar covalent bond, something that we did in a previous video. But what's important to note, and what, what I want you to see here, is that the 3 came from the chlorine. That was the electronegativity of the chlorine. And the 2.1 was the electronegativity of the hydrogen. So which one had a larger electronegativity? The chlorine. Now, what that means is the bigger the electronegativity, 
the stronger that atom is pulling those that pair of shared electrons. It pulls the pair of shared electrons closer to it. So actually, technically, what is happening is the shared pair of electrons, it is in the middle of them because they're sharing it, but it lies a little bit closer to the chlorine and a little bit further away from the hydrogen. So now I'm not going to draw it like drastically because they're still sharing it, but the electrons lie closer to the chlorine. So because the chlorine has a bigger electronegativity, we say that it is partially negative and the hydrogen is partially positive. Okay, partially means a little bit. So if you look at the hydrogen chloride molecule, HCl, one side of the molecule or the compound is more negative, the other side is more positive. That is called an imbalance of charge. It's called uneven charge distribution or asymmetrical charge distribution. One side of the molecule, the chlorine side is more negative. The other side of the molecule is more positive. So they have basically written it out because the charge distribution is uneven. It causes a polar molecule. And we can call this thing a dipole. Di means two, it has two poles, positive and a negative. Now that is very different to the hydrogen molecule that I showed you earlier, where they share the electrons evenly. There is a even charge distribution. It is not a polar molecule. It's a non-polar molecule. If you take a look at BeCl2, beryllium chloride, you can see that I worked out the difference in electronegativity for the BeCl bond, 3 minus 1.5. Chlorine is 3, and Be, beryllium, is 1.5. It gives me 1.5, which is a polar covalent bond. If you look at my Lewis dot diagram, what I want you to notice is that here, I, can sh I showed you that chlorine has a higher electronegativity. What happens, and a nice way to think of this is, if for this bond, this one over here, this BeCl bond over here, we can draw an arrow pointing towards the atom that is more electronegative. So between this Be and this Cl, which one is more electronegative? Which one has a higher electronegativity? Cl. So we draw an arrow that points that way. Okay, same thing for this bond over here. Between this Be and this Cl, which one has a higher electronegativity? This one over here. So we draw an arrow going that way. Just like in Newton's laws, when we had, for example, a vector going 20 newton to the left, and 20 newton to the right. Remember, the overall, the net vector was zero. It kind of works the same here. It's called a net dipole moment. We have an arrow going to the left, an arrow going to the right. Overall, they cancel each other out, which means although the bonds are polar covalent, overall, the molecule is non-polar. Okay, I go over this in a lot more detail in my next video in the playlist. I'll link it up here. This is just a brief introduction. So please go watch that video next. I do loads of exam examples as well. So watch for throughout the whole video. I'll see you in that one very, very soon. Bye, everyone.